ladies and uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here with us in this webinar organized by Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo at New York University, unfortunately still only online, to talk about this book, Talking to the Girls. We have the fortune of having with us the editors of the book, Edi Giunta and Maria Antrashatti, and with their guests, Annalise Orlek and uh, Jennifer Guglielmo. They're going to introduce them properly. I'm just delighted that both Annalisa are, and uh, Jennifer are back. They also have been uh, guests at the Casa to talk about uh, labor history, women rights, and many other topics. Uh, Marianne Trashatti was uh, on our faculty, unfortunately, at the time of the pandemic, so we didn't have the time to consolidate our collegial spirit physically, but other chances are going to happen. I'm just delighted that we have um, uh, this chance to present this book here. They, they're presenting the book in several different occasions, several different venues, but I think this one has particular meaning for all of us. Uh, we all were remembering before for the first time in which we uh, organized a celebration um, uh, for uh, the victims and the survivors of the Triangle Shirt Risk Factory fire in 2001 at the Casa. And we started at the site and there were names, there were songs, there were uh, stories told at the site. And then we marched silently to the Casa where we had the more academic uh, part of the commemoration that was the historical part in which um, the, the moment was reconstructed and retold uh, in, 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 in detail. And from that moment on, I think it has become that historical moment, uh, that building um, central to, uh, to our lives in some way. I passed by the Ash building that is now the Brown building. It's, it's a building that now belongs to New York University um, and there are labs and the biology department is there. I pass by it every day and I see these uh, plaques, these bronze plaques almost every day. And the idea is that you cannot abandon the memory of something that important to two bronze plaques. There is work to be done. And my colleagues that are here today to, um, are, have taken that task very seriously. That memory survives and becomes alive if there is work done on it. And they've done a fantastic job. And the 19 essay that you find in this book are a testimony to the kind of work that, that they have done and they continue to do. And of course, it's, it's a work of historical reconstruction of uh, uh, literary value because things are also written of artistic value because manifests are also produced. But um, as you will hear from all of them and all of us, it's also a very personal work that is done here. And when, when facts like these are remembered and brought back from a, from a dark past to be uh, brought to the attention and to be put on the stage, on the political and historical stage today, um, we tend to put everybody together, you know, the, the 146 victims. And I, I believe what is also very important that has been done is to go to the individuality of each of the victims. Each of them had a story. And that's another extremely important thing that has been done, the reconstruction of who they were, where they lived, where they came from. And uh, uh, recently, I believe like as soon as we sent the email invitation for this event, um, we re received an email from a lady, from an artist, her name is Norma Greenwood, and she was kind enough to send us uh, this photograph of a painting dedicated to the Triangle Shirt Risk Factory Fire. I, I thought it was beautiful and very powerful. These two stripes of color, the red and the white, that from what I understand, uh, were immediately associated to, um, to the workers and the victims. Um, so just this is just the last uh, example of how those facts inspired uh, artists. So I thank Norma Greenwood for having shared with us this beautiful painting. And uh, last Monday, uh, so that is 
two days ago, we had the, the fortune to receive at Casa Italiana the Italian ministry, Minister of Equal Opportunity, Elena Bonetti, that you see here, uh, along with the Consul General of Italy, uh, just across the street uh, from the Ash Building, from, the, from what is now the Brown Building. And you will see that there is scaffolding because the, the, the monument, the memorial, uh, is being built right now and should be inaugurated uh, next year. And here you see an image of uh, the minister with the architect, uh, that is one of the two architects that won the international competition for the design of the um, of the monument and the minister was very interested and very moved both by the telling of the story and by what richard told her in terms of um the, the preparation of the memorial here you see carabasso who is reading excerpts from um from one of the accounts of, of the chronicles uh, of the events this is one small thing that we continue to do. Every time we have a political leader, a politician from Italy, we tell them where we are, and we tell them that the place in which uh, we stand is a few blocks from the Triangle uh, Shirt Race Factory building where the fire happened. And uh, I have to say that we were able to bring to the, to the site the minister that just was here, but also the deputy president of the Italian Senate, Valeria Fedeli, and the speaker of the House of Representatives in Italy at that time, Laura Boldrini. And so every time we have a chance, we bring the story to the attention of Italian authorities. Of course, this was a huge American tragedy that had an enormous impact on, on labor rights, on women's rights in this country. But because of the fact that, as you discover reading the book and, and some of the essays in particular, the fact that uh, about 40, I believe, of the victims were clearly of Italian origin. And there is one essay in the book um, that talks about the efforts of, of these Italian person to reconstruct the birthplace in Italy of the Italian workers. This is also an Italian tragedy. So in this case, to the um, historical moment that it represented for women's rights and for workers' rights. We add for immigrants' rights because both groups more represented were Eastern European Jewish women and Italian, specifically Sicilian women. So I think it's important also for the countries of origin of these girls to take inside to make their own what happened and the consequences of what happened. And we will continue to do that. And especially when the memorial is gonna be up, and then it's gonna be more easy to tell the story because the memorial tells the story in a graphic artistic way that I expect to be beautiful. And the next step for my colleagues here on the panel is that we should think about a liturgy, a ritual, something that we can propose and that can become a constant. Liturgy, after all, in Greek means an affair of the people, something that the people does. So it has this collective uh, nature. So let's think about it. Because, and I was reminded of this because one of the diplomats that came with the, with the minister asked me, qual è il protocollo, qual è il rito? And we don't have it yet, but we will. And that's it, just a proposal, ask your students, uh, Eddie, Mary, Annalise, and Jennifer, uh, for suggestions. And we will come up also with a ritualized way of paying homage to um, these workers and to these women. And uh, I think I've spoken enough. Men should speak very little at these events and listen. So I'm ready to listen to the great colleagues that we brought together uh, tonight to present Talking to the Girls, Intimate and Political Essays on the Triangle Shirt Race Factory Fire. And now I leave the microphone and the virtual floor uh, to a person that was with us from the very beginning when we did our first uh, memorialization of the Triangle Fire um, and has been a presence and a steady presence um, throughout the years. I, I go to her immediately for anything that relates to this story. And um, she teaches um, 
and memoir writing. And one of the courses she elaborated is exactly a course on um, the fire and how you remember, how you memorialize through literature. And I'm delighted to introduce to you, Edi Junta. Thank you, Edi. Welcome. Thank you so much, Stefano. Uh, for me, being a Casa Italiana, even virtually, is a homecoming. Um, in fact, I, you know, I rarely say Casa Italiana, is really Marimo, I just say Casa. Um, so thank you for your generosity, for your hospitality. And uh, I will never forget that you were the person who, in the late 1990s, opened the door, the doors of Casa Italiana to Italian American women writers uh, and allowed us to have so many events, which then culminated them in, in the Triangle Fire commemoration. And, and we did a, a you know, ritual of sorts with Gioia Timpanelli, right? Who told the story and, and, and then we all called the names. And I don't know if you remember this card, the collage by Nancy Azara, um, which also commemorated uh, um, not only the fire, but this particular event we did, uh, um, we did the Casa Italiana and Phyllis Capello sang labor songs. So we will come up with more and more rituals and I hope we will continue to do this work uh, um, with you um, at Casa. Um, you know, it's interesting what you're saying about um, um, the Italian involvement, uh, because I really first learned about the fire when I was uh, a 17 year old, uh, um, um, bald feminist in Sicily, except I did not know it was called Triangle Fire and I did not know that there were Italian workers. I only knew it was a fire that were workers that died in New York City. And, and it was very much in the heart of uh, of, uh, of the feminists of the 1970s. And, and then over time, uh, the um, discovery and reclamation is still ongoing. And, and there are so many wonderful initiatives that are going on um, um, in Italy, not only um, of commemoration, but also of artistic work. Um, as you said, uh, you know, this is a really very, a very personal book. And, and so I would like just to, you know, say a few, um, um, a few personal um, remarks. I'm thinking of Marsala today. And Marsala is a place, a place on the Western coast of Sicily. For me, Marsala is a place that I remember from my elementary school book, Los Barco de Mille Garibaldi and these thousand men who landed there in May 1860. It's also a tablespoon where the yolk of a fresh egg swims uh, in the glistening hue of sweet Marsala wine. And Nonno Giacomo says, mangia, in Goya, tutta salute. It's the glorious sunset, which is celebrated with a festival del tramonto. They watch deeply moved as a returning immigrant. But Marsala is also the place that for me and for many others uh, is forever associated with Caterina Maltese and her two daughters, Lucia, and Rosaria, three of the 146 who died in the Triangle Fire, the reason for our gathering tonight. Those of us who are intimately involved in Triangle history have come to know 14-year-old Rosaria as the youngest worker killed by the fire. So when I think of Marsala, I like to picture Caterina and her girls in the town that made them. But there is also the heaviness of history. There is the sweetness of the wine and the pain of migration. There is the sunset and there is the fire. I would like to dedicate with all my fellow presenters tonight, this gathering to the memory of Caterina, Lucia and Rosaria. Their memory belongs in the memories of their family and the history we are responsible to keep alive, remembered. So the place where we gather tonight is uh, physically not far from the Brown Building, as, as Stefano said, was once known as the Ash Building, where Caterina, Lucia, and Rosaria died, and part of NYU. And let's remember the role of NYU students who helped save many workers on March 25th. The place where we gather tonight uh, is also um, the many places, the places where each of us and our audience are joining from, and is also this virtual 
place that whether we like it or not, we have to be grateful for it. But what we gather is also the place of memory. And memory is a place. It's a place where we travel at times willingly and deliberately, at times reluctantly, at times accidentally. And it is in this place that we find story and history. And this is the driving force of talking to the girls' intimate and political essays on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Our 19 contributors are family members of Triangle workers, some uh, who died there, some who survived, some who worked there in the past. There are writers, there are scholars, artists, teachers, activists. And so we asked each of our contributors to travel willingly, deliberately, reluctantly, accidentally to the country of memory and to return to the place of the Triangle Fire, but also to many other places of memory that crisscrossed with the memory of the fire like eating arrowroot biscuits with a grandmother who happens to be named Frances Perkins, or visiting Aunt Rose Schneiderman, hero of the labor movement, or the elusive memory of a father waving from the window of a hospital, or the collapse of a factory in Bangladesh, or the exclusion of black women from early 20th century garment industry. Memory is many places. So 21 years after we gathered at Casa Italiana Zarelli Marimo with Stefano as our host, we return here to celebrate and to remember this uh, historic event uh, that touched uh, all the people who were there, the families of those who died, their friends, their neighbors, and all the people who were inspired uh, to push for change, for social justice in their memory. We're very fortunate to have two incredible historians uh, tonight, Annalisa Leck and Jennifer Guglielmo. And we're very fortunate to have Annalise write an essay for talking to the girls. And, um, um, and Jennifer, of course, was uh, instrumental in organizing um, that commemoration. So um, I would like to um, invite Jennifer to share some thoughts about uh, this momentous gathering or anything that you want uh, to remember from uh, the first gathering and, and so many other memories of the work that we have done together in connection uh, with the Triangle Fire. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for hosting this. This is a um... Uh, it's emotional. I'm getting emotional uh, just being a part of this. I'm remembering us gathered um, over 20 years ago, right? 21 years ago. And um, just how powerful that event was. I remember gathering at the site. I remember the cards. Remember, Eddie, the cards that were passed around to everybody who participated and we each read a person's name. You can see, I don't know if you could see, but mine says Della Costello and her age is unknown. So I was thinking as you read about the, um, the women that we are remembering today, um, just how some of them, we don't know much about them. We don't even know their ages, right? Um, but we hold them in our hearts and, um, and we honor them. We honor them every year at uh, this time of year. We honor them in our teaching and in our writing. And this anthology is an incredible honoring. Um, it's, an, it's a beautiful anthology. I, I just encourage everyone to, 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 to read it cover to cover, to buy it for the, your loved ones. It's a, it's a very moving, very personal, very heartfelt. It's a book that is just every essay as a beating heart. Every essay is an expression of, of love and loss. And um, so the, the only other thing I, I, besides my incredible love and admiration for this work that um, Marianne and Ed, Eddie, that you've done to bring all these voices together to honor these women and to honor this, um, 
this, the impact that that fire has had on all of us uh, who learn about it. The moment you learn about the Triangle Fire, you're just forever changed, I think. I teach it every year and I watch what it what it does to students because we learn that that so many factory workers were young, were children. We learn that um, just how dangerous uh, were their working conditions were. We learn how heartless um, their bosses were um, to not provide them with a safe working environment. And um, we just learn how incredibly tragic um, this, this um, event was and how many people mourned this and still mourn this, um, the fire, the Triangle Fire. Um, at the time in 2001, I was writing my book, uh, Living the Revolution, which is about Italian women's resistance and radicalism in New York City, and it also covers New Jersey, um, from 1880 to 1945. And I had been inspired by Annalise's work um, to, um, to go into the, the garment industry as a historian and write about the kinds of dreams that um, Italian garment workers had and the kinds of organizing they did, their everyday forms of resistance, the way they built community and took care of each other and um, tried to create some spaces of humanity and kindness in, in within these factories that could be so alienating. And, um, and I studied how they organized. And so much at the time when I was writing, so much of what women's historians knew was that 1909 had been this really important year for garment workers. It was the uprising of 20,000. And we knew this story. It was mostly Jewish immigrant women. And it's the famous moment where Clara Lemlich, you know, the, the ILGWU is, is run um, by primarily by men and they vote to end the strike, but the women refuse and Clara Lemlich, um, a young woman, Annalise will remember the details better than me, but she was barely, I think she was still a teenager when she got up, she had the courage to get up and just say, no, we, we will not end the strike. This is, um, we are not going back to work. And that strike for so many of us, um, was quite powerful um, just in the, and it, it initiated a, a generation of, of labor organizing in the garment industry. But what it, what, what we, that story also said always was how Italian women had been the strike breakers, how they had not um, been in solidarity with the Jewish women garment workers in 1909. But what I learned when I researched this history was that this, the triangle fire was a, profound catalyst for Italian immigrant women and for Jewish immigrant women to begin to organize together, to realize that they had to traverse the language bar barriers. They had to find a way to um, build a movement together, even though they spoke, you know, in the case of Italian, so many different dialects. Um, and in the case of the ILGWU, which was an, an organization, a union that was so rooted in, in Jewish um, kind of cultural traditions, like the, the fire was the moment where they realized that we, we need each other. Um, we have to organize together. And Italian women began to enter the ILGWU in larger numbers, and they would be a force in the 1913 strike. And then in the 1916 and 1919 strikes, Italians were were um, critical to, to those strikes. So the fire was a catalyst on, for so many, in so many ways, right? It was a catalyst to, um, to um, for many people to call out the uh, inhumanity of capitalism to, um, and to think about what it would mean to, to truly end this system. And of course we have not done so yet, but we are still in the process of, of doing this work. We are part of their legacy, right? We are carrying on that deep commitment to ending these systems of oppression. And, um, and so we do so in their name, in the name of Della Costello, age unknown. So I pass this on to Mary Ann. Prashati, my sister, my Irish slash Italian sister, both of us Irish and Italian. <laughs> right. Descended from Irish domestics. That's right. Exactly. Both of us. All right. Thanks, Jen. And thanks, Edmige. And thanks, Stefano. And um, 
Julian and Kazi Italiana. And as Ed Vijay pointed out, there's such an, uh, a close relationship between NYU and the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. So it's, it's really fitting that we have an event here. Um, there was, I was at the event in 2001 it, and it was transformative. Um, and I think it's really uh, important that we are back here. And we've done other events since then. And Stefano is always very hospitable. Um, and I look forward to doing events next year when we dedicate uh, the long overdue memorial. Um, and this book, Ed Vijay and I have talked about this a few times. This book is, um, it is an act of commemoration. Um, it's not a straight up history. Uh, it's not a straight up uh, collection of personal essays. It's a hybrid, um, you know, people, in the book, which if you haven't uh, had a chance to read it, I, I hope that you do. It is quite beautiful. Um, it looks beautiful, as Ellen Todd, our art historian uh, contributor, noted yesterday. It, it looks beautiful and it also reads uh, like a beautiful work. So I hope that you uh, immerse yourself in this beauty. And it is an act of commemoration. It is a collective act. There are 19 contributors and it is a co-edited uh, volume. And at every step of the way, uh, collectivity and collaboration were key to this project. Uh, there was absolutely nothing uh, that was done alone. And triangle activism is like that. That's one of the things I think that Eddie and I share, um, our perspective on uh, activism around uh, triangle and all of its significance as something uh, that you do in community. Um, you, you really can't do this kind of work alone. You can't, uh, Talking to the Girls is a book that I think neither Eddie nor I could have edited without the other. Um, it really bears the mark of, of uh, the kind of mutual love and, and consideration that we put into the project, but also the unique things that each of us brought in and the, the very personal and unique perspectives of our contributors. Um, but also now it, it speaks uh, with many voices, but at the same time. Um, and throughout the project and throughout all of the events, I'm, I'm reminded constantly of the kind of uh, connection between working on this volume with Ed Vijay and all of our extraordinary contributors and all of the hosts of our events and working on the Triangle Fire Memorial, um, which I have been doing with Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition for over a dozen uh, years. And like the book, uh, that is collective work. Uh, it is this extraordinarily um, powerful and simple, but 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 extraordinarily powerful design um, that is the product of two uh, designers, Richard Junyu and Uri Wegman, um, and it is a a design that is being lovingly brought into life by a, a, an ever growing uh, group of people. Um, so, like the book, the memorial has many pieces to it. Um, the the you know the the horizontal, uh, the vertical, the different the stainless steel, the stone glass, the names, the ages, the testimony um, of eyewitnesses, the narrative of the fire in Italian, in Yiddish. It will be the first trilingual memorial, um, probably anywhere in the U.S. Um, certainly the first English, Italian, and Yiddish memorial in New York. Um, and many people are are making it happen and pulling it together. Um, and I, I hope that we will join again next year when we dedicate that memorial and really kind of celebrate um, the community that was born out of this really awful um, tragedy. And there are a number of people from the coalition here, Joel and Andy, um, uh, Diana Marr is here, uh, Annie Lanzalato, uh, Surf Maltese, who is an honorary member of the coalition. Um, and so, you know, it's such a wonderful powerful experience to be lifted up and supported um, and nurtured by uh, one another the way uh, people in the coalition do. Um, and so I just want to, I guess I just want to close by kind of looping back to something that Advija said in her opening comments, you know, here we are virtually, um, but, but here nonetheless um, in the place of memory. And I think uh, it's really important to remember or to, yeah, to remember that uh, we are here um, in community. We are never alone. 
Um, and, and we are here in triangle memory, holding each other close. And in that closeness, in that togetherness is where we really find our strength. And, and just like the activists, the labor organizers, the social workers, the politicians, the suffragists, I mean, the, you name it, um, the people who came together and found their community after Triangle and found their strength in that community and their families and their morning rituals and their political activism, we find our strength in one another. And um, they showed us the way, right? They showed us that change is possible, that we can make things better. Better, but we can't do it alone. We have to join together. And, and that is, I think, one of the most powerful lessons of Triangle. And I'm, I'm so honored and privileged to be sharing that um, experience and that lesson with all of you tonight. So thank you very much. And I will now pass the, the uh, metaphorical baton to uh, one of our stellar contributors um, and a stellar labor historian, Annalise Orlick. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I want to start by thanking Jen for inviting me to that event 21 years ago, uh, sponsored by Casi Italiana, but that took place in uh, the Great Hall of Cooper Union. And uh, I remember the night before, I was really nervous about what I was going to say in that place. And at a certain point in the middle of the night, I realized that I felt the ghosts and I had to channel the ghosts. And you can't walk into the Great Hall where the uprising of the 20,000 was started, where young Clara Lemlich made her, you know, took her stand and said, you know, I am one of those girls, right, who are being talked about here. And, you know, we, you know, we're going to stand for ourselves. We're going to rise. Uh, Triangle is often thought of as a tragedy, but part of the tragedy um, is also that uh, those many, many who died had been activists in the uprising of the 20,000. Um, and uh, as police came in and, and removed the mourners, uh, some of them were really uh, struck, like, like being struck in the chest by their grief at recognizing some of the young women um, who uh, who had had struck, who had stood on New York street corners, who had walked through the winter uh, to get better working conditions. So all of this is the story of Triangle. Triangle is, you know, has long been um, kind of an iconic uh, memory and, and call to action uh, in the Jewish radical community and in the Jewish immigrant community in which I grew up. And, um, you know, it, it has been so important uh, it, and, 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 and commemorating it as an Italian-American event really began when, when Jen invited me and when I met Eddie and Marianne. And um, they when they started thinking about this book, I wasn't sure you know, what I could contribute to it. And, and, and they convinced me that my grandmother's story um, was an important part. And so I'm going to introduce you to my grandmother in a minute and, and tell a little bit about her. Um, but... Uh, I think it was an important moment for me in terms of the memorial when I made the decision for sure to be part of the book. And that was when um, the call went out to bring bits of cloth uh, to lay into the uh, into a ribbon, into a ribbon quilt that would um, be then cast in, in metal down the front of the memorial. And I brought a uh, hand embroidered handkerchief that my grandmother, who had worked at Triangle, had made and uh, and given to me. And it was it was very powerful coming together. In addition to uh, the Triangle Fire being an Italian tragedy, I think I've come to realize, and uh, many descendants of, of Jewish immigrants have come to realize, uh, it was also a Ukraine tragedy. And as we think in this moment of uh, the horrific tragedy, the world-changing tragedy unfolding in Ukraine, uh, it is worth noting that many of the Jewish victims of the Triangle Fire were immigrants from what is now Ukraine, in, including my, my grandmother, Lena. So I'm gonna start by reading just the paragraphs where I introduce uh, the two women my essay is about. It's called Triangle in Two Acts, From Baba Mises to Bangladesh, and Baba Mises is Yiddish for grandmother stories. Um, and uh, the two acts are uh, my grandmother, Calpona, and the fire, last time, this time, and next time. So let me quickly introduce, read what I say about my grandmother and Calpona to introduce them, and then I'll read the first couple of pages of the essay. My grandmother, Lena, entered the shops when she was nine and worked a triangle from 1900 to 1907, the year she had her first child. When her kids were older, she went back to garment work, sewing buttonholes in assorted union shops for decades. She would never work in a non-union shop, she told me fiercely. She never did. And then um, Rachelea Lieberman was her full name. She was raised on Henry Street in the heart of the Lower East Side. 
She had emigrated as a toddler with her parents from Kharkiv, a violence prone city in Ukraine that was home to many Jews and still is. The pogroms were bad after 1881, her parents told her, and Etta, my great grandmother had relatives in New York, so they took their babies and left. I was with my daughter and a friend of hers when we happened on Lena's Henry Street house on the day of the Triangle Centennial. The girls had volunteered to participate in Ruth Sergal's pop-up annual chalk memorial. They were assigned a house on the block of Henry Street where my grandmother and her parents had once rented an apartment. My father and his brother and sister lived there when they were little. During the 1980s and 1990s, there was a Chinese owned garment factory in the building. On March 25th, 2011, a stream of Chinese families gingerly stepped over the pastel name, name and dates that my daughter and her friend were chalking. Some stopped to talk to us of then and now. And the other character in my story is Kalpona Akter. Kalpona Akter was born almost a century after Lena. Like Lena, she began sewing clothes for an exploding global fashion market when she was a child. 12-year-old Kalpona and her 10-year-old brother sometimes worked 24-hour, 20-hour shifts for weeks on end. They slept on the floor when they, where they sewed until the order was complete. And then they were allowed to go home for a while. Kalpona labored in Dhaka's 20th century sweatshops until her late teens when she was blacklisted for union organizing. Since that time, it has been all she does. She organizes, gives speeches, travels the world to tell the stories of life in today's global rag trade. She has entered still smoldering factory rooms to find labels or invoices that could prove which global corporation had paid to have clothes made there. A lot of what she does she told me in 2016, when we spoke for hours at the World Social Forum in Montreal, is to help workers figure out who they really work for in order to help them seek repair, reparation, some fleeting measure of accountability from the titans of today's cheap disposable shirts and skirts and jeans and sneakers. So I first met Calpona at the Centennial of Triangle. I'm going to read a little bit of the opening of the piece because it sets in context, as we've been doing earlier in this session, um, setting this in context as an Italian tragedy. This sets the Triangle Fire in a bit of context um, as one of the, the Jewish tragedies that live in a, in a world of memory where I grew up. In the early 1970s, Brighton Beach was not yet Little Odessa the epicenter of Soviet Jewish immigration to New York, and I should say Ukrainian Jewish immigration to New York. It was a neighborhood of retired garment workers, almost all of them East European Jewish immigrants who had arrived between the 1920s and the 1970s. Many of my neighbors bore the scars of traumatic memories. They also wore with pride their memories of triumphant labor uprising in the shops. The ILG, as they called the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, included numerous retiree groups in Brighton and thousands of, quote, amalgamated retirees lived there, too, in the war bass houses built by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union in the early 1960s on the border of Brighton and Coney Island. As these white haired men and women gathered in the vest pocket parks or on the Brighton Beach boardwalk, they told of their long ago struggles. Survivors of the Russian Revolution, Warsaw Ghetto fighters, survivors of Auschwitz and the Stalinist purges invoked their dead right alongside their living. Stories of the Triangle Fire jostled for place among these memories in the narrow neighborhood of Art Deco buildings, wooden walkways and sand. As told on those warm nights by the card players and chess players and mandolin players and aging political firebrands, the story of the Triangle Fire was an origins myth a cathartic tragedy of the bad old days. That's how we built the labor movement, they told me. That's how we got to the point where we are now, where you can go to work without having to put your life on the line. I grew up with those triangle stories and even closer to home, the tales told by my grandmother, Lena, who worked there as a girl. Often her stories were parables of deep friendship and loss. Lena had bonded powerfully with her triangle coworkers as they grew to womanhood in that most famous of shops. She had comic tales, but many of her tales were tragic. Young women searching for birth control, leather diaphragms were sold quietly by one of, quote, the girls. Friends seeking safe means to abort their ninth or maybe their 10th child whom they could not afford to feed. Lena's reminiscences of danger and disaster ran through my mind as I listened to the songs of struggle and survival that rang out in my neighborhood in Yiddish, English, sometimes Italian, in the senior centers, on the streets, on the boardwalk. 
I often smelled traces of fire while walking by the sea. It drifted up into my nostrils from dark singed wooden boards, charred by campfires lit by homeless women and men who slept on the sand. The smell of burned wood, leftover food and wet clothing marked this outpost on the edge of a city that in an act of desperation as it faced bankruptcy had released hundreds of nonviolent mentally ill men and women from public hospitals and asylums. And many had landed on the sands of Brighton Beach. But the lingering scent of fire stirred memories too for my grandmother and her friends of lessons that Lena never wanted me to forget. She and other garment union retirees believed that we had come far from those days thanks to the, use, the rise of powerful unions, thanks to Franklin Roosevelt and Francis Perkins, to state and federal labor laws that were the original Triangle Memorial. Over the years, that history had become a comforting myth. Um, and, but as I work as a professional historian um, and, and being the granddaughter of Lena has shaped my work, so too um, has my friendship with Bangladeshi garment union leader, Kalpona Akhtar, um, who we first met at the centennial and we've stayed in touch and I've interviewed her and she served as um, a touchstone for my work on garment um, uprisings and, and garment workers organizing today. As the second decade of the 21st century dawned and the centennial of the Triangle Fire approached, I began to understand that the memory of the fire evoked something much more recent than 1911. It cast a spotlight on the realities of today's global garment industry in which factories continue to burn and workers regularly die. In terms of worker safety, union rights and living wages, the globalization of the garment trade since the 1980s has taken the world backwards at least 100 years. Hundreds of thousands of women garment workers I learned are fighting the same battles that my grandmother and her militant young friends fought, this time in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Ethiopia. The fires this time are as devastating as avoidable, as much the products of greed and dehumanization as the Triangle Fire. On the evening of the Triangle Centennial, I stood on a line of hundreds slowly filing into the Great Hall in the basement of New York's Cooper Union, 10 years after the event that, that we've talked about here. As I reached the front of the line, a union friend introduced me to Kalpona Akhtar, perhaps the best known leader of the 21st century garment workers movement. Thanks to global pressure, Kalpona and her fellow activist, Babu Akhtar, had been freed from prison so that they could travel to New York for this event. They had brought with them purple t-shirts with white line drawings of triangle workers standing side by side with 21st century Bangladeshi clothing makers. In bold above the drawings were these words, not one more fire. When Kalpona climbed onto the stage of the Great Hall to address the audience, her eyes swept the room and she stood silent for a moment. Then she said quietly words I have never forgotten. In Bangladesh, she said, it's not 2011, it's 1911. And my work after that, she inspired the next book that I wrote called We Are All Fast Food Workers, The Global Uprising Against Poverty Wages. Where I got a chance to meet garment workers um, from Bangladesh, from Cambodia, um, from Central America and learned the stories they're telling today. So as we invoke the memory of the Italian um, and Ukrainian Jewish women and the Irish women who, who died in, and, and who lived and died and worked in Triangle, um, I think we, we also should remember these, these modern uh, heroines of the labor movement. So um, yeah, I guess we'll stop there and, and time to, to throw it open for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Annelise. And you know, your your essay um, is exemplary in the way in which it shows us how the line between personal story and history is uh, is a, is a is a line that we keep crossing back back and forth, and and you know it's just so seamless. But I think we have to acknowledge what a what a what a major soul searching one is to do in order to be able to achieve that balance in writing and i just want to honor that work it's not uh, it's not effortless it's hard work uh, especially for those who, of us who are trained uh, to do academic writing uh, um and thank you also for uh, for acknowledging the ukrainian women including your grandmother in in, in fact in a list of them Lulu Lol and Suzanne Bradbass have of the birthplaces of uh, the triangle worker. Many indeed are from from uh, um, from Ukraine. I want to remind uh, um, our audience that uh, um, we're going to take questions in a few minutes, uh, and I think that I believe there are a number of, of questions in the chat. Uh, um, but also wanted 
to um, all of us teach in one way or, or the other um, triangle fire. Um, I've been teaching our course uh, that focuses exclusively on, uh, um, um, on the triangle fire, except it doesn't. It doesn't focus exclusively on the triangle fire because I start with a new colossus. Um, which is a poem uh, by um, a descendant of uh, um, refugees who escaped uh, um, Portugal to escape the Inquisition. And then I continue with, uh, uh, with Maria Messina and Luis de Salvo. Um, uh, and um, but in terms of the historical context, also to, uh, to remember the triangle, um, it's an Italian story, it's an it's a, um, Eastern European Jewish story, it's an Irish story, but it's also the story of the black women who were not part of the garment industry. And these are stories of all the workers of today that you, um, that you write uh, um, so powerfully in your work. Uh, um, so it really is a story that, and, and that, that quote, those words of, of Calpona sum, sum it up. So, um, powerfully so. Thank you. Um, Stefano, do you think we can start uh, taking some questions uh, from, uh, from the audience? Yes, absolutely. We already have a few very interesting ones, actually. <clears throat> and I would like to start with uh, Phyllis Capello. And first of all, I want to send her a virtual hug. Uh, that very night when we did our first uh, commemoration, uh, her voice uh, is what keeps resounding in my memory uh, when she sang a cappella by herself, a few songs of the, of the labor movement. And I remember her fiercely in her red beret singing on the stage of the Casa and on the side of, um, of the fire. So Phyllis has a question, I think it's for all of you, for all of us. When and where during your day do you think of the triangle? And my answer, Phyllis, is very simple. I, I say every morning when I walk from my apartment to the casa, I pass by um, the, the Brown building. And I think our panelists, when and where? Okay, that's kind of I, 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 all day, every day, and probably will for the next year until we dedicate the memorial. Um, it's, it, you know, that to be completely honest, it's, it is this extraordinary project that is, um, yeah, it involves so many people and and things and um, and events. So I, I, there probably isn't a day that I uh, don't think about um, the Triangle Fire. And Marianne, a question, a sub question for you. Walking back to the casa with the minister after we left the site, and she spoke at length with Richard about the memorial. She said, "Ma, dieci anni ci hanno messo, but ten years they it took them to to put together." And I was wondering, you're, you're an Italian minister, you should know something about, you know, the, 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 the red tape involved in bureaucracy. But I knew it was, it was a, pro a process that was slowed down not only by bureaucracy, but also by your desire to get the community involved, to work with the neighborhood, not to make it as an imposition, but something that could be embraced by everybody, even the people living around there that at first were very skeptical about any kind of memorialization that would exceed the two uh, bronze plaques. So I, I bet that for you, it has been uh, a daily thought and a daily concern of uh, of pushing and at the same time of, of, uh, of pushing it all together, not as a uh, project of just a few, but something that uh, should be embraced by the whole community. So congratulations also for the work you did of lobbying, convincing, talking to people and making them understand why it's important to have it and why it is important to have it done that way. So thank you for that and please the rest of the panel. I just want to say it's a team effort. I, thank you for the thank you and I'll pass it on to everyone in the coalition. Um. Well, I mean, clearly, um, you know, doing this book, uh, um, which we started uh, sometimes around 2016, I think, um, you know, has, uh, has really uh, intensified uh, the, 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 the frequency, the quality that of, you know, triangle thoughts and ideas and the interactions uh, with all um, the various people and not just uh, the people who were part of, of the book. Uh, you know, this book, as, as Marianne said, was collaborative. You know, Jennifer led us 
to, to some contributors that we didn't know, someone else uh, led us, uh, gave us information. I mean, there were so many people all the time. But one March is gets very intense uh, because of all the commemoration, but also because in my, and during the spring, I always teach this course on the Triangle Fire. And my students, most of my students work on uh, on very, very personal projects. And, and so um, the work that I had to do as a teacher, I had to help them tell their own triangle fire story. And so I um, I really need to, to make a lot of room to, to help facilitate that. And, um, and it's a very, very moving process uh, because every year, no matter um, um, the age, the major, the gender, the ethnic background, the geography, every student has their own Triangle Fire um, story. Jennifer or Annalise. I'll just say quickly that I, for me, it's March 25th every year is, it just is like, I feel like I wake up and with that pit in my stomach and I just feel all day that, you know, this, the weight of that event. And um, so that, I feel like that's the day every year where I come back to this history. If it's, and of course I'm, I teach this history in my classes. So there are other times when I connect with it, but the day, I think every year, it's like one of those days that's seared in my, my mind. I think about it every time I come across something in the house of my grandmothers. Um, and I think about, um, I think about it uh, when I teach, and in particular, I, I keep coming back to um, a teaching American history workshop that I did with a bunch of middle school teachers. And there's an essay in this book, a beautiful one, talking about teaching triangle to middle school teachers. And I, I think about your words, Eddie, and how true they are that, that uh, what the teacher said is that it's the easiest way to teach um, you know, to teach about the early 20th century, to teach about change in government and the social safety net and all of that, because when they tell that story, each kid relates to it personally, right? Because each kid has a story of work and sacrifice and immigration. And so I feel like it, it, it keeps coming back all the time. And I just want to have a word of Kalpuna's where she said, you know, when I come to the United States, they talk about triangle as a tragedy. And of course it was, she said, but I talk about triangle and, and we in Bangladesh talk about it as, as a, as a turning point beyond which things started to change. Um, and, and so, you know, for them, it's, it's, it's a tragedy that, that out of which comes something very good and important and lasting. I have two um, quick questions. Uh, one probably is more for Eddie, an anonymous attendee says, uh, I've started the book, it's great. As of now, is this taught in Italian schools? Well, first of all, we had to get it translated. Uh, but um, on the 25th, um, I will be um, speaking about the book, uh, The Casa Internazionale delle Donne, in Rome with uh, Maria Rosa Cutrufelli, Anna Maria Crispino and Gisella Modica. And, you know, they are Italian feminists who are part of my Italian memory. So that feels very momentous. And there is another event also by an Italian organization. And um, La Repubblica published an excerpt from the introduction. So that's a, um, that's a good sign. And definitely this is a book that, um, uh, we would love to see translated uh, uh, in Italian because uh, it, it's it's a collective uh, uh, book about history that belongs uh, to all of us. Um, and I hope to be able um, to um, to talk also to um, school teachers in Italy. Um, there is one who actually will participate in an event. She did the research for Scintilla, which is this play inspired by Triangle Fire that um, was performed in Italy. So there are things happening. I will keep you posted. Thank you, Eddie. And of course, now the minister has the book in her hands right. and she was extremely interested, moved and uh, so we also have an ally in her and uh, I hereby pledge the support of the Casa financial support for the translation of the book. So 
put that on the table if it happens with the, with the next presentation of the Casa del Leone. We would love to have the book translated into Italian, so we will definitely be able to come up with a contribution. I don't know whether to pay for the entire thing translated or whether it is part of it, so count on us for that. And now a question for Mary Ann. Uh, do you have any works about the troubles in Ireland? Of course, you evoke Ireland. We must talk about it a bit. You know, I was just responding to that. I was typing the answer. Um, you know, I'm I'm my 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 great love uh, among U.S. radicals is an Irish American, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and I'm actually finishing a book on her civil liberties activism. She was this extraordinary civil liberties activist. She was an anti-fascist. She was probably the first English-speaking member of Antifa in the U.S. This extraordinary anti-racist activist, and she was an incredible anti-imperialist also. Um, because of her relationship with Jim James Connolly um, and Jim Larkin and et cetera. And so in learning about her, I've met a lot of Irish American activists and scholars and because she felt very deeply and Irish um, and she felt deeply connected to her Irish uh, um, ethnicity and to the movement for an independent and free socialist Ireland. Um, and I'm just learning this history myself. So I don't really have any recommendations uh, to give um, to the anonymous attendee who asked that question. What I would suggest though, uh, a kind of easy introduction, there are, there's a, a really great and growing a community of, of um, scholars on social media, Irish and Irish American, and there are some really extraordinary um, podcasts. And I might start there. Um, and other than, you know, just the normal search that you would do for general works, um, that's really the best advice I could give you right now. I just, it's just not a literature that I have a, a command of yet. Um, but I will say this for a pop culture kind of view of, um, of what it was like to be a kid during uh, the troubles, watch Belfast. It's a really good movie. Um, and I asked a friend, uh, a, a woman who's become a friend of mine who is an activist now in Ireland, what she thought of it. And apparently a, a lot of Irish um, activists um, in the North, uh, in Northern Ireland have a nice, uh, a positive view of the film too. So, I, you know, I, other than to say there's stuff out there, but I'm, it's just not at my fingertips, um, but it's in book form, podcast form, and even this pop culture medium, um, you know, uh, that, and if you come across anything good, let me know. It's just not a literature I know a lot about yet. Um, sorry. Belfast is great. I totally uh, approve the pitch for, for the movie. Ah, uh, thanks. And now I, we have a, a more complex uh, question that I, I'm happy to engage in. And uh, it's about monuments. It's from Alessandra Abate, uh, who says, in light of recent event and people demanding to remove monuments, and statues of colonialism across the United States, it is more important than ever to answer to those demands and to tell new stories of Italian history, and I would say and not only Italian history, in the United States, both to take responsibility for Italy's colonial past and to propose new cultural heritage symbols in the hope to celebrate the long forgotten history of Italian radicalism in the United States. Uh, this is why I have written a profile for Place Matters uh, on the Italian Labor Center located in on 14th Street, so two blocks from here. Uh, what are other historically relevant sites for Italian radicalism in New York City that you think needs to be memorialized? And I second this question because one of the projects Casa Italiani is working on right now is a new video series, and we expect to do segments of maybe four or five minutes on the places of... Italianness uh, in the city and around, and exactly because we want to um, sort of relegate the monumental, uh, the the history of monumentality that has underlined uh, these decades from the very beginning. So the big monument to the big man, and not all these big men are bad. I'm happy there is a monument to Giuseppe Mazzini, for example, or to Fiorello La Guardia. They were big men. I think they deserve their monument and they can stay. Um, but I think the, the problem is not to raise more monuments to the individual man or woman of the, of, of the moment. And this is a collective uh, monument. Uh, both in the in the because it memorializes a collectivity of people, but also the way in which it was realized and it was um, conceived 
it's a, there are the two authors, of course, but they wanted a, a, an involvement of a community. And Annalise uh, spoke about bringing her grandmother handkerchief and making it become part of the of the memorial. So I believe, from my point of view, this is the direction. If you have uh, uh, answers for uh, Alessandra in proposing uh, historically relevant places of Italian radicalism in New York, let us know. We would like to involve to make them part of these series that will feature um, churches, shops, uh, street corners, buildings, um, and, and much more to help people recognize the history of our community in the city, um, uh, physically and geographically, where it developed and how. So I, I second the question of Alessandra. Any answer for her? I hate to answer a question with a question, but I'm gonna. Is there a um, is there a plaque on Lucky Corner up in East Harlem? Because that would be that's one that comes Which to corner, mind. Marianne? It's Lucky Corner. Lulu Lolo would know the exact address, yes. but it's the corner where LaGuardia spoke, Mark Antonio, and they they would speak before the election and then win, and so it got it earned the the nickname Lucky Corner. That would be a really good it was place. Lexington and 116th Street. Is it? Yeah. 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 I was thinking how it would be fun to do uh, like a walking tour of radical Italian, you know, American history. And of course, it would be very centered in in Harlem and East Harlem. And, um, you know, like just to think about how to do that in a way that makes visible, like what you said, Stefano, that doesn't center on kind of just famous people. Um, and, and usually that means fam focusing on men, right? How do you do this in a way where you, where you tell like, you know, the histories that Annalise and I write or labor histories, working class women's histories, right? When, if you center those histories, then it changes the geography of what you're celebrating. And so that's why to me, a walking tour could be really powerful because then it would be about sharing stories and about you know, what it meant, like just these spaces, what a stoop meant, you know, in early 20th century, you know, like the street corner, why the street corner was such a significant political space. Um, you know, the factories, the the cafes, the the bars, the meeting places, right, where these conversations unfolded and to try and bring to life some of the, some of this, um, I don't know, the folks that are so unknown, you know, or the places where the radical newspapers were printed um, and the plays where the plays, the radical plays were performed and, um, you know, where the anti-fascist, where Italians joined with African-Americans and the anti-fascist rallies in Harlem to protest the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, you know, there'd just be this wonderful way to also weave together the histories of these communities so that we see how Italian radical culture is so connected to other, to the neighboring communities, the so communities that they lived, you know, that they lived within. Harlem was such a multi-ethnic multilingual um, neighborhood. So that would be my dream, you know, to, to have it be a, an occasion for storytelling and for to connect histories and to think about the most marginalized. You, you already have supporters, uh, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> Lynn Elizabeth says, walking tour, great idea. And uh, Joanna Club sermon hi, Joanna, uh, says, Benjamin Franklin High School is an important location. Yeah, and Lulu, yeah. Da, Lulu does those tours. Our friend, Lulu Lolo, who also has a beautiful performance that she did at the Casa on the, on the Fire, also does these tours. And our idea of the project I just mentioned to you about the, the, the sites, the places of Italian and Italian-Americanism in New York, eventually will be put together in a, in a tour in the sense that it will be on a map and you can take the map and you can choose different kinds of tour. And one could be, and you just gave us an idea, um, the tour of Italian radicalism. Um, so people can do them on their own, but as we like the collective component of it, of doing it in person with other people that are like-minded and want to know, um, to find out more. These are definitely all uh, great, great ideas. And again, we'd be happy to work on them. Um, Can I, I just, yeah. a quick pitch for the Barry Labor Hall in Barry, Vermont. It's not, it's well outside of New York, but if the uh, 
you know, if the tour is going to go farther where Italian immigrant socialists and anarchist quarry workers brought the children um, out of the bread and roses strike in 1912 to get them away from the violence and to feed them well. And the people at the Bari Labor Hall are always, they're always trying to fundraise to keep the thing from collapsing. So um, I hope it would be great to connect this community and, and Casa Italiana to them. Yeah, can I, I just add that. one more thing? The, the Triangle Fire Memorial will be New York City's first labor memorial. We have, uh, you know, it, New York may be the most, have the highest union density in the U.S. We have no labor memorials. So there is so much work to be done marking. I mean, I think the walking tour idea is a really great idea, um, but also like things that are there that that you just see, even if you're just walking by on your own, we really need to get better at that. Um, I mean, how can we not just, have a labor yeah. memorial? Just to bring you back for a second, also to this idea of the memorial and 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 and, and, and remember and the mapping and the walking tour. Um, I want to remind our audience that if you walk around, uh, um, particularly the Lower East Side, uh, and but also even Oboken, uh, and and you see um, a drawing, a chalking that's been done. Uh, on the sidewalk in front of, of a building. That's part of a project created by Ruth Sergo called Chalk. And every year the names of the 146 are um, being written on, on, on the pavement. And, and it's a beautiful project. So if you look for Chalk, Ruth Sergo, see you in the streets, you will find it and you can become involved. But even if you're not in New York City now, um, the initiative is really spread and people do it in, in you know in different parts of the country and the world I do it every year um in um, in in front of my house uh, um at least this last couple of years so and that is is also um is 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 a memorial it's ephemeral art by Stella memorial it's a wonderful essay by Ellen Todd in, in the book that um that writes about the different ways uh, the triangle fire has been uh, uh, memorialized and this is included a question that I think is for all of you. Uh, what surprised you in your research about the Triangle Fire? Was that something that you wouldn't expect to find and you did? I learned so much from Marianne, from my contributors. Um, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to single out uh, one particular thing. I think there is also something about um, uh, studying these this history and and following closely um, um, the the time that the, the half an hour less than half an hour um, of the fire that you start to just it starts sinking in and so I think that it's not just about about learning but when the knowledge becomes something that really sinks sinks in. But I learned I, I learned about um, black garment workers. I didn't know anything about that, that was enormous. I learned about um, um, the Chinese um, American strike of 1982 from Mei Chen. Um, um, I, I learned also about um, the way in which all our contributors could bring together the very personal and, 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 and the public history to go into the living room of Ross Schneiderman or uh, to watch uh, Francis Perkins uh, with their grandson, those are were also part of the learning experience. And I learned that um, or once again, the working together is the way to do it. Yes, Marianne, we're, we're together on that, in that. And I saw that our panelists did an incredible job because they spoke. Um, and it was very emotional, I understand, for all of us. And at the same time, they were also able to answer individually by writing uh, in the chat space to many of your questions. Uh, it's incredible. They're multitasking. They're focused on one thing. And at the same time, they can do everything else. Uh, it's a rare gift, and they have it. And it's a pleasure to uh, work with them. Um, if uh, Are there any more questions that we um, need to address? Um, one, um, Rosaria Caporino was asking, and Marianne replied to her, um, is there any way to still be involved in the uh, memorial? And then the answer that Marianne gave is very open and very encouraging and very welcoming. 
if you feel you want to commit some of your time or ideas or resources, there, there is still time. And again, it's a collective effort. There is one year that separates us from the inauguration of it. Um, so I think we can do nothing but encourage you to be involved and to get in touch. Take a look at the website if you want to see uh, renderings of, of the project. Uh, it's a beautiful collective uh, project that has so many different layers. Um, Eddie, but you should conclude, uh, first of all, because of your role and also because you have a poetic uh, bent in your words that I don't have. And I think this was very historical, but it cannot but close with, with a poetic touch that I think you're the one who is able to give. So please do. And thank you again to all of you and to all the people, about 70 people that followed us uh, today in these um, a presentation of the great book that I strongly suggest to everybody uh, to read, uh, to meditate on, to give us a present, and our next step to have it translated into Italian and maybe Yiddish. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, and, and thank you. Um, you know, when I started doing work on Italian American women writers, um, and I came to this work rather reluctantly because I went through my American assimilation. I, I wanted nothing to do with Italy the first few years I was in in the in the United States, uh, and it was uh, through my um, encounters and friendship with. Uh, Jennifer and Marianne and other Italian um, American women, I came to find um, an effective and in, an intellectual home in, in the Italian American community. And it became very important uh, for me to think of ways to create bridges. And Stefano, you remember the wonderful symposium, um, Italian and Italian American women in 2000, so 22 years ago, which Casa hosted. Uh, so when I think about um, these bridges back and forth between Italy and Italian America, and, and, and they have been happening and it's very powerful, but with Triangle, um, we are creating bridges in all sorts of directions uh, across time uh, and space. Uh, and we are creating coalitions uh, based, uh, based uh, on not only on political solidarity, but really um, a profound uh, affection. When I think of the 146, I feel a profound affection and an ethical responsibility. And I believe everybody who does work on Triangle feels that. Um, I was talking the other day with uh, Senator Martese, who has been such an incredible figure in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, really um, uh, making it possible for the memory of Triangle to exist uh, um, in a public space and, and his family suffered the great loss of three women. And we talked about the triangle family. So family in the best possible sense of the word. And I think it's what we did tonight. We came together as, uh, as that kind of family. So thank you, Stefano. Thank you, my sister, co-editor, collaborator, co-fighter, Marianne, Jennifer, Annalise, and our wonderful audience. and. Uh, Looking forward to the next gathering. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all.